Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC3 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. Linux Newslog is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I would like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. For those of you who have, thank you so much for supporting the show by subscribing. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and get into some of the cool stuff for this episode. Starting off over at Tech Republic, uh, over at techrepublic.com, how businesses are getting creative with the Raspberry Pi. This is pretty interesting. It's basically talking about how a $35 Linux board is being used to rapidly piece together custom appliances and solve specific business problems. Uh, the Raspberry Pi, as you may or may not be aware, runs Linux, so it makes sense that businesses would be looking to Raspberry Pi for certain things. Uh, the, store, the next store that we have is from Enterprise Tech Storage Edition. Ceph Clustered Storage dons a Red Hat. So Red Hat is the world's largest supplier of support services for an open source software, and it has delivered its first update to the Ceph Storage software it acquired back in April to give it a better footing in the OpenStack cloud market. The company is adding data tiering to the storage software and also a new method of replicating data that is less expensive allowing Steph, Ceph to be used for cold storage. So pretty awesome. You know, it, it's the cool stuff like that, that that I find, you know, where the metal really meets the, the road, the rubber really meets the road. From uh, the nextweb.com, Chrome 36 launches with rich notifications, improvements, new incognito design, doodles on Android, and more. Pretty neat. Uh, Chrome is now available for Windows, Mac, and Linux, and Android as well. Among the changes are various additions and improvements, as well as the usual bug fixes and performance tweaks, etc., etc. You can update to the latest release now using the browser's built-in silent updater, or download it directly from google.com forward slash chrome. So, uh, pretty cool. I'm personally, I'm not a Chrome user, but there are a lot of people that are. So, you know, if you are, definitely uh, update if you have not already. From the register, OpenWRT gets native IPv6 slurping in a major refresh. The embedded Linux distro OpenWRT has updated native IPv6 support allowing devices to automatically pick up an IPv6 address as well as an IPv4 one from an internet service provider if possible. The release candidate is codenamed Barrier Breaker and runs the Linux 3.10 kernel. OpenWRT's 14.07's improved IPv6 support with DHCP version 6 is useful for people with IPv6 friendly ISPs, although the software has been able to do IPv6 over IPv4 tunnels with IPv4 only internet providers for a while. So the IPv6 stack includes support for router advertisements in DHCP version 6 with prefix delegation, multi-homing with a local prefix allocation and source constrained routing. So uh, a long time in coming, OpenWRT obviously is really popular in the router space and uh, IPv6 is just, you know, that much sweeter, especially having it natively built in. So pretty cool. From uh, eetindia.co.in, Wind River Ecosystem Program aims to speed NFV deployment. Wind River, a company providing software for intelligent connected systems, has announced its Titanium Cloud Ecosystem Program for the carrier grade communication server that they uh, uh, make. According to the company, the program will allow it and its partners to ensure the availability of optimized interoperable hardware and software solutions at speed time to market for service providers and telecom equipment manufacturers deploying infrastructure based on network functions virtualization, otherwise known as NFV. So pretty cool, definitely 
uh, check it out, especially if you are a Wind River user. The next story that we have is from mis-asia.com and Intel is going to ship a Generation 2 Galileo open source computer in August for $60. Uh, this is kind of your um, embedded development platform. You can do a bunch of Arduino stuff. Definitely uh, check it out. Um, it's the Intel's answer to the $25 Raspberry Pi computer. It's available uh, in August, um, about $60. I don't have all of the details on it, but uh, you know, it's been something I've been keeping an eye on, especially for doing embedded development. So definitely uh, check it out. The last story that we have is kind of some commentary, and, and I, I wanted to talk about this because this is something I've noticed and something I've kind of done in my uh, own life. It's over at uh, blogs.dailynews.com. It's in the Click blog, and it's entitled, it's a blog post entitled, Debian Developer Switches to Mac, Doesn't Look Back, and Yes, We Should Be Worried. So... Debian developer John uh, Dowland writes about switching from Linux to the Macintosh with OS X. And um, basically, you know, states that, uh, you know, it he, he uh, tried OS X out as part of doing his job and effectively never looked back. I kind of had a similar experience uh, myself. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where I do... Linux at work, I do Linux development. I'm not a Linux kernel developer or anything of that nature. I do application development. This application runs on uh, Linux. And so I don't really have to run Linux in order to do my job. And in fact, my job supplies a Retina MacBook Pro for me to do my development on. And um, it's just one of those things where in order for me to do my job, I need a computer that just works. You know, and I've made the discovery through, you know, using, you know, I use Windows and Linux and OS X, all three of them on a fairly regular basis in some capacity. OS X for me has been the least offensive of, of the various computers. And Apple has done a, a pretty good job of giving decent developer tools with enough access to run open source software and do open source development without being a total and complete turnoff, um, which I can't say the same for Windows or any Linux distribution that I've tried. So this is one of those things uh, where, you know, the, the, the author of the article here, you know, basically... Uh, John Dolan says, you know, basically after he switched to Mac, he goes, it appears I have switched for good, and I'm quoting, um, I've been meaning to write about this for some time, but I couldn't quite get the words right. I doubted I could express my frustrations in a constructive, helpful way, even if I think that my experiences are useful and my discoveries valuable. Perhaps I would put them across in a way that seemed insightful rather than insightful. Uh, I wasn't sure anyone cared. Certainly the GNOME community doesn't seem interested in feedback. It turns out that the one person that doesn't care is me. I didn't realize just how broken the free open source software desktop is. The straw that broke the camel's back was the file manager replacing type ahead find with a search but to seemingly switch metaphor. It turns out that I'd been cut a thousand times already. I'm not just on the other side of the fence. I'm several fields away and I kind of... Uh, I'm in the same position. I can totally relate to this guy. It's like, look, my, <laughs> my most valuable asset that I have is my time. And if I'm going to be doing development or using a computer, it needs to get out of the way and let me get my, my stuff done so I can get on with my life. Um, I cannot be burning time waiting or ditzing around with, with a stupid computer I need to get my stuff done so I can get my stuff done. So uh, anyway, the 
author of this blog post, Stephen Rosenberg, says, what can I say? With the Macintosh seemingly left for dead by Apple while the iPhone and iPad shovel in the revenue, Mac laptops have quietly become the platform of choice for developers everywhere. This is true. Even at home, I run a Mac. I do development at home. I do, develop, I do Java development on a Mac at home. It shouldn't matter what platform I do it on. Eclipse runs on just, just about everywhere, and yet I still do it on a Mac. That should tell you a lot. Uh, meanwhile, frag he continues on, fragmentation in the Linux desktop space and what appears to uh, be not just a lack of attention to detail, but a willful rejection of it haven't helped. That said, I'm firmly in the buy cheap run Linux camp. Again, I used to be this until my time actually became really valuable. And now uh, I am not in the camp of, I'm speaking here myself, now I am not in the camp of buy cheap run Linux. Buy cheap run Linux means you're going to spend a lot of time, again, my most valuable asset and resource, waiting for your slow, cheap computer that you spent $150 on. You know, Macs are not cheap. There's a reason why they are not cheap. And it's not because you're paying for the Apple name. It's partially that, but it's largely because when you buy a Mac, it has an SSD in it, a big SSD in it. It has a lot of RAM in it and it has a really fast CPU. I have yet to see a newish Mac that is not fast. They're all fast. You're paying for that speed. $150 computer, get blown right out of the water by a new MacBook Pro. It's, no, it's not even a competition. Um, anyway, with that being said, uh, the author of the blog post here says, I'm firmly in the camp of uh, buy cheap, run Linux, and I figure that Microsoft-driven laptop price war to combat the Google Chrome book will provide a whole new class of sub $250 machines on which to run the Linux distribution of your choice. That sub $250 machine is also going to be slow. Anybody who has run a two to $3,000 MacBook Pro straight out of the box can tell you that $250 machine is going to suck. It's, it doesn't matter what operating system you load on it. It's going to suck. Um, he continues on, since I don't have $1,500 plus for a laptop that won't accept OS updates in a few years and generally don't need to run the Adobe Creative Suite, I don't have the opportunity slash burden of trying to figure out how much free, as in freedom, software I should shoehorn into a Macintosh OS X environment. Well, I can tell you as somebody who does uh, open source software development on a Mac, it's actually really easy. Get OS X, load Xcode on it, load Homebrew on it, and uh, through Homebrew, install the packages you need. It's a piece of cake. It's very straightforward. It's very, very simple to do. Um, and any open source software package that is halfway serious about being open source or being a useful tool provides an install for OS X or an easy way to compile for OS 10. It's not even an issue. Anyway, um, then he continues on, I can see how developers who aren't Linux distro developers want to go for what's easy, if not at all cheap. Well, again, this really measures, this This really boils down to how you, what, what you consider to be cheap. If, if the only thing you, if you don't value your time and the only thing that you look at is how much money you're outlaying for the hardware and the software, then by all means, go buy yourself a $250 computer, load your distribution of choice on it, and get on with your life. You know, I'm a huge advocate of you should use what works for you. But with that being said, you know, going back to going right back to my most valuable asset is not my computer, it is my time. And I want a fast computer that's the least offensive of everything I've tried that just works and I'm willing to pay for it because it saves me that much more time. So uh, then he continues on about he, he would love to see, you know, a company, um, you know, put forth some, some uh, you know, some resources to make a Fedora workstation with the target audience for developers. You know what? That already exists. It's called MacBook Pro, and Apple makes it, and it's awesome. And so I'm just going to leave it at that. You should use what works for you. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, shoot me an email, linux at quicksurf.com. 
I will be more than happy to have a conversation with anybody. I have been using OS X exclusively now uh, for a while myself. I do try other distros and that sort of thing and do, you know, I mean, I do have exposure to Windows and Linux and, you know, my day job is running Linux or writing, writing applications for that run on Linux. So, uh, you know, I mean, I, I do use Linux for, on a fairly regular basis, but all my development, my home computer, it's all on OS 10. I do a lot of open source stuff on it. It's not an issue and it's fast. You pay for it, yes. Are you paying more because it's Apple? Yes. However, you're also paying more for it because it happens to be one of the fastest computers you can buy. It's that simple. That it's, I don't know how else to say it. I have yet to see a Windows computer that costs the same, that costs less. Let me rephrase that. I've yet to see a Windows computer that costs less, that runs as fast. They don't exist. So, um, you know, anybody who wants to prove me wrong can sit there and do spec for spec and say, ah, this computer has got exactly the same. I've yet to see a, a, a non OS 10 computer have exactly the same hardware as what you get on a Mac. So, you know, it's, it's real simple. It's not just, oh, it's got this CPU and this RAM. Apple comes up with combinations that are fast. It's the CPU, RAM, SSD combination on how they're connected together. It's not just a simple, well, it has this CPU and it has an SSD and it has this RAM and it has this video card. It's, it's the same computer. It's not the same computer. It's, it's all about the ethernet, the, the gig wireless, uh, the gig Ethernet, the uh, 802.11 AC wireless, the combination of the RAM, they put fast RAM in there. It's not just, oh, it's got an SSD. It's, it's a fast SSD in OS X. It is, if you have not used a new MacBook Pro and compared it to something that costs $250, I can tell you right now, even a $1,000 computer maybe starts approaching the speed you get with a MacBook Pro, a new, nice, fast MacBook Pro. I've been running computers for a long time and the fastest computers I've ever used are MacBook Pros or Macs in general, recently, in recent years. I'm not saying that's always been the case, but in recent years, since Apple has switched to x86, they generally, on their professional line, when you buy a top-end Mac, it is the fastest computer you can buy, period, bar none. Are you paying for it? Yes. However, I refresh my Macs every four to five years. So there you go. I buy a Mac, I buy the most expensive one, the fastest one. I don't have to spend another dime on it for another four or five years. At the three, four year mark, I maybe might upgrade the RAM, put a bigger hard drive in it. That's about it. So anyway, I've talked about this long enough. Send me an email, linux at quicksurf.com if you disagree or what have you. But uh, that's my position on it. I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, comment on this, um, you know, you should always choose what's good, what works best for you. You know, that's always been my position for me. That's what works best for me for an awful lot of other developers that also, unfortunately for Linux is what works best for them. So anyway, uh, read the uh, blog post and, uh, tell me what you think. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. I'll see you then. Bye.